Okay, I think it's time to start. There's certainly plenty of you here, and you're all very welcome to this session on what not to translate. I have with me three translators and writers who are, well, we're in for a treat, put it that way. Um, and the first most notable thing about what they translate, as opposed to who they are, is that they all translate for starters from non-Roman scripts, which I think for me would be an almost insuperable challenge to begin with. Um, so for me, that would be the first what not to translate. But they actually have much more interesting things to say on the topic. So um, I'll read you a little bit about what we're going to talk about, and I'll introduce them, and then we'll go one, two, three, and they will talk. They will give a little uh, presentation, each of them, then we'll have a bit of a discussion amongst ourselves, and there will, there will be time for you to ask questions at the end. So the introduction. In a world where writers and free expression campaigners are still recovering from the attack at Charlie Hebdo, and where a perilous freelance income can be supplemented with well-paid translation work for large, morally dubious organizations, I'm not looking at the <laughs> sign on the wall, um, this discussion will consider where best to draw the line. Our panelists are going to discuss their own ethical dilemmas as translators, wondering how best to balance personal ethics with the need to earn a living, and what happens when translating work could endanger your own safety. Um, this is not a joke. Salman Rushdie had an Italian translator uh, very badly injured and a Japanese translator killed uh, at the time of Satanic Verses. So it's, it's not funny. Um, Using the choices they've made in their own careers, join us for a fascinating debate as our panel discusses what and what not to translate. Arch Tate on my left learned Russian at Latimer Upper School London, Trinity Hall, Cambridge, and Moscow State University. He has a PhD in Russian literature and uh, began translating in earnest in 1986 after a meeting with Valentina Jakes, then editor of the magazine Soviet Literature. From 1993, he was the UK editor of the Glass New Russian Writing Series, whose editor-in-chief was Valentina's successor, Natasha Perova. To date, he has translated 28 books and short stories and articles by most of the leading Russian writers of today. In 2010, he was awarded the Penn Literature in Translation Prize for his translation of Putin's Russia by Anna Politkovskaya. I'm afraid a lot of deaths are occurring in the first few sentences. She, of course, was shot for her work in writing on contemporary Russia, and particularly on Putin. Um, his latest translations are Arina Prokhorova's 1990 Russians Remember a Turning Point, and Lyuba Vinogradova's Defending the Motherland. Alice Guthrie, on my far right, is mainly a freelance Arabic yes. literary Sorry, on my next right, I beg your pardon. <laughs> is mainly a freelance Arabic literary translator and editor, specializing in comparative bilingual texts of Arabic-English literary translations. But she also does bits and pieces, you say. She wrote this, um, of media work, commercial editing, copywriting, research, and teaching. Current translation projects include two full-length short story collections by contemporary Syrian writers, never more apposite, forthcoming this year, and her main current editorial work is on a series of novels from London's Darf Press. She was translator in resident at London's Free Word Centre in 2014. And it is, of course, um, Eleanor Lang from the Free Word Centre who's organised this panel and is one of the 2014-15 American Literary Translation, Translations Association Fellows, originally from the East Anglian hinterlands, uh, which I know you now mean Suffolk. <laughs> Uh, she has recently settled in Bristol after about 20 years of wandering around, wondering where home might be. Obviously very profitable. And uh, Tenzin Dickie or Dicky Tenzin? Which way around? Dicky Tenzin. Dicky Tenzin. We read from right to left. Uh, translates contemporary Tibetan literature, focusing on a group of poets and writers from northeastern Tibet. Her translations, poems and essays have been published in Indian literature, the Yellow Nib, Modern English Poetry by Indians, Tibetan Review, The Washington Post, and Cultural Anthropology, among other publications. 
Dicky Tenzin is editor of Treasury of Lives, a biographical encyclopedia of significant figures from Tibet, Inner Asia, and the Himalayan region. She is also an editor of Tibetan Political Review and English editor of the Tibet Web Digest. She used to work as special assistant to the representative of HH the Dalai Lama, His Highness the Dalai Lama, to the Americas at the office of Tibet, New York. She has an MFA in fiction and literary translation from Columbia University, where she was a Hertog Fellow, and a BA from Harvard. She is a 2014 ALTA, the American Literature Translation Association Fellow of the... Oh, she's an ALTA Fellow of the ALTA. You're an ALTA Fellow. And let's see who I am. Um, Amanda Hopkinson <coughs> translates from... Spanish, including Elena Poniatowska, Carmen Boyosa, Isabel Allende, Portuguese, José Saramago, Paulo Cuello, and French Dominique Manotti. I'm professor of literary translation at City University London and a former director of the British Center for Literary Translation. I also write books on Latin American and European photography, um, none of which has much relevance to the ongoing discussion, which is going to be initiated by Arch, who would like to stand up and speak to you. I've got, um, I've got very strict instructions not to go over 12 minutes, and as I'm a terrible gas bag, I've written it all down. Um, by the way, these um, large, morally dubious organizations that pay translators very well. Can you hear me now? OK. Uh, these uh, morally dubious um, organizations, do you have any emails? I you have any addresses, I might like to get in touch with some of them. <laughs> I've had this problem that, um, you know, I've been looking for morally dubious large organizations all my life, and I've really had very little success. Um, who I have translated for are uh, a number of large organizations, but they've been terribly virtuous, like um, Penn, Index on Censorship, Open Democracy, U.S. institutions, got the Getty Foundation, Hudson Institute, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and others a little bit spicier like Radio Free Europe and the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. Hooray, and I didn't manage to get them elected. Also small organizations, journals of literature and translation, and in the West and in the Middle East, and publishers of art books and catalogues. I very much enjoy translating art books. There have also been helpful oligarchs, including one whose negotiating skills rather pleasingly made a huge dent in the annual profits of the Ford Motor Company, uh, another who was chief of Yeltsin's presidential administration, and another oligarch is actually currently funding the presence in London of a delegation of very good Russian writers who you can hear um, in the evenings at Waterstones in Piccadilly. Um, and uh, if you Google Slova, if you can remember that, S-L-O-V-O, Slova Festival, uh, you could find out what the full program there is. These are wealthy people, but they're not evil. They're committed to freedom of speech. They're committed to supporting young writers. And uh, they're also um, eager to see better understanding of Russian culture in the West, uh, not for ideological reasons, but for simple, uh, decent patriotic reasons. And the oligarchs coexist, I think, rather uncomfortably with the present uh, Russian government. I've also, over the years, had commissions from people who simply wanted to be better known in the West. A presidential candidate, a banker, uh, who, um, the, the banker, um, his secretary sent me uh, an email and said to, her boss wanted me to translate his book on investment. And I thought, you know, well, if he can't be bothered to write to me, I'm not going to reply. Um, so a couple of weeks later, I got another email saying, um, you do realize we're talking $20,000. So I, I replied, and my children tell me that the book is actually very worth reading. I commend it to you. It's called Cashing In on the Crisis of Capitalism. 
uh, also a professor of economics, a teacher of public speaking, a coffee importer with a blog, and several writers who just got in touch on spec by email. In a class of its own, however, is the glass Last new Russian writing translation series, whose uh, founder and supporter and um, pillar for 25 years is Natasha Parova, who's in our midst. And um, uh, she uh, was also uh, editing a series for young writers, again funded by an oligarch. And sad to say, uh, Glass New Russian Writing and the debut translation series are being closed down, I think it's fair to say. Natasha translated Dr. Spock's baby and childcare book uh, many years ago after she found it so helpful in uh, bringing up her own twins and made lots of money and spent the whole lot on glass new Russian writing. And in the years since when that money ran out, she's subsidized the translation series out of her own earnings as a translator. Uh, the debut series was funded by an oligarch, uh, but he has uh, ceased to do it. My own latest translation, lots of adv advertising going on here, is um, Ubevina Gradova's Defending the Motherland, uh, and it's going to be launched tomorrow uh, at Pushkin House. If you Google uh, Pushkin House, you can find out the details. Anybody who'd like to come, you're very welcome. It's been uh, well reviewed. It's about the Soviet uh, air women who fought Hitler's air aces during the Second World War. Uh, and many, of course, uh, didn't, didn't survive. But um, it's been written by Luba Vinogradova, who has already a reputation as an amazing researcher of uh, Russian military archives. And she's got some extraordinary uh, stories, uh, many of them from the diary of an NKVD snoop whose job was to spy on these air women and uh, report back on their morale. And uh, so the picture you get is uh, not by any means the kind of cliché that you might expect. All these organizations and individuals have got an interest in translation, which is really one of the least profitable um, areas of uh, publishing, I suspect. I hope, though, that um, I've made it clear that I certainly don't think that their motives are dubious. They're generally very altruistic. And um, Russia is uh, a worrying country. I mean, I think my fellow speakers are also uh, translating uh, the, uh, uh, from languages of countries which have many problems. Uh, but Russia's worries are primarily for Russians. I was born 15 miles from Moscow, but uh, my Moscow was on the River Volga, and both are in Ayrshire in Scotland. Um, so I have staunchly anti-Napoleonic principles dating from its foundation and also Scottish uh, principles. And when I'm deciding what to translate and what not to translate, uh, those are basically the principles I look back to. There are things that I wouldn't translate, um, but not because of risks, but because uh, I think either they're manipulative or um, deliberately disinforming, and so you simply give them a pass. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is still alive and recently wrote, Today's political elite in Russia have set their sights on consolidating their right to govern in perpetuity, providing them with power without accountability and material wealth. The media serving them defame Perestroika, vilifying those who undertook the vast and perilous task of bringing reform and elections to a country weighed down with problems that had not been addressed for decades. Gorbachev's watchwords were perestroika, restructuring, but also glasnost, transparency, 
and Glasnost is a cause I believe translators should serve. Shining the spotlight when necessary into dark places, but also dispelling ignorance and prejudice about the culture they are mediating. There is a readiness not to hear or to forget the history of how Russia's war against Chechnya was restarted to save Boris Yeltsin and members of his family from criminal prosecution by finding a successor who would give them immunity. These are unsavory matters, and to many in the outside world, almost unbelievable. There is a job to be done here in ensuring that the truth of such matters is widely known. Delusion is not a good basis for diplomacy. Given the difficulty of choking off the flow of information with a new Iron Curtain, the present government resorts to increasingly blatant intimidation. Many thought journalist Anna Politkovskaya was untouchable until in 2006 she was shot in the murky circumstances that betoken involvement of the secret police. Vladimir Putin, on whose birthday she was shot, said the degree of her influence over political life in Russia was extremely insignificant. Not, I think, subsequently. The murders of Natalia Estemirova of the Memorial Human Rights Center, herself awarded the inaugural Anna Politkovsky Prize, of human rights lawyer Stanislav Markielov, and most recently of Boris Nemtsov, send the signal that nobody who stands up to the regime can consider themselves safe. In the past 20 years, the Chechens, in the course of two wars with Russia, have lost more than 200,000 people. That's out of a population which today stands at 1.25 million. More than 40,000 of those killed were children. The use of ground-to-ground -ground missiles and other outlawed weaponry by Russian forces against the civilian population in Chechnya is, Ahmed Zakhaev says, proof that the purpose of the war is not a fight against international terrorism, as claimed by Kremlin propaganda, but collective punishment of the Chechen people for their aspiration to independence from Russia. A major difference between the first and second Russo-Chechen wars, the first launched by Yeltsin to improve his abysmal approval ratings, and the second by Putin's backers, was that during the first war, the world's media, including most of those in Russia, were on the side of the Chechens. Then came a mysterious succession of abductions of Russian and foreign journalists, and later the murder of humanitarian aid workers and employees of Western companies blamed on the Chechens. At this time, Zakhaev writes, the entire world was expressing admiration for the heroism of the Chechen people and the Chechen government. The purpose of these abductions was to change our image to one of cruel, primitive natives and criminals pursuing not lofty ideals of freedom, but bloody, ill-gotten gains. It had the added bonus that by frightening off journalists with the threat of abduction, Chechen could become a no-go area for news gathering. After which, Kremlin propaganda, exploiting the powerful machinery of disinformation it inherited from the USSR, could spread around the globe whatever murky lies about the state of affairs in Chechnya it chose to, without fear of refutation. Unfortunately, this black operation by the Lubyanka and its local political and criminal agents met with considerable respect. The free flow of information is something evildoers need to prevent. As far as translators are concerned, I think we have to bear in mind that silence is tantamount to acquiescence. Okay, could you all hear that? Or is it really quite difficult? Come see, come sir. I think if we're all happy sitting here, um, these mics you can get closer up to. Okay. That's great. Um, so it's over to you, is this, How is this? Okay, or maybe I That's need better. to all right, yeah. enunciate and speak louder. 
Um, I am so honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I thought I would um, uh, really talk about why I translate, what I translate, and it will get into what I do in translate and you know why. Um, I started. It, re it started with an interpreting job. So I was in college, um, and it was a f volunteer amateur interpreting job for uh, for a former Tibetan political prisoner. So her name was Ngawang Sangjil, and um, she was 13 when she was at a public protest in Hassa, and uh, this was in 1992, and uh, she had spent about 15 years in prison uh, when, so by the time she got out, she had spent about 15 years in prison. She was still, you know, in her late 20s. Uh, so I, she was speaking at Brandeis University and no one else was available, so I was asked to do the job. And when I met, I met with her about 15 minutes before we were going to speak to this group of 40 people. Um, because we just wanted to make sure that I had uh, some of the right specific vocabulary that was needed to tell her story. Uh, you know, words such as domkang tupshi for solitary confinement, logyu um, for electric rod, so that sort of thing. And, you know, later I was thinking about the words that I needed to tell her story, and I just I was just so mad. I was so mad about it, about the injustice. So one thing, actually, when I say I needed the right specific vocabulary, I, don't, I had the words in English. Uh, I, I, I needed the words in Tibetan, because although, actually, I grew up in a Tibetan refugee settlement in India, and you know, I came, moved to the US when I was about 14, I grew up speaking Tibetan, learning Tibetan. My native language, my mother tongue, uh, was Tibetan. It still is, but my secondary language now uh, and my primary professional language is English, right? Uh, and that's just, that's just a byproduct of exile and diaspora. So now, even though I... Um, well, what, what happens is I translate from my L1, right, my native language, uh, into my L2, which is now my professional and primary language. Um, and it's just, yeah, it, li growing, living and growing up in exile, and of course in occupied territories, puts limits on certain things, and language is just one of those limits. So it was in graduate school in the US uh, that I first actually began translating literature. And I started off translating um, the six Dalai Lama's love poetry, which are, you know, they're about 200 years old, but written very simply, very beautiful. And um, it's all very metered verse. Uh, and it sounds gorgeous in Tibetan, but you know, when I was translating it, there was always something off about the translation. Um, the, the poems in English didn't really feel like proper poems in English. So then um, I started looking for other things and, uh, and it was around then that I first came towards uh, the contemporary Tibetan writing that I now translate. And uh, so contemporary Tibetan literature is actually, it's really, really, really new. Uh, you could really say that it was born in the 1980s, um, invented, developed, created. Um, and the stuff that I uh, specifically focus on, a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is, so these, po these poems and short story and other writings by a group of writers in northeastern Tibet. They call themselves the third generation. And uh, so they write very specifically, you know, in reaction to what they kind of see as the first and second uh, generations of Tibetan poetry. Um, so they write against that, and uh, but 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 basically, uh, it's just beautiful, gorgeous work that also deals very strongly with identity and is uh, 
place to vary specifically in location. Uh, so, and among this third generation, there's, you know, there's new and emerging writers, there's also older established writers who all Tibetans know and, and, uh, and, and really like. So why do I, right, why do I translate these poets and writers? There is, in terms of the translation that's coming from, uh, in terms of the translation there is of Tibetan into English, other world literatures, there's very, very few translation of contemporary Tibetan writing. There is, uh, you know, there's been enormous amount of old Buddhist literature from Tibetan into English, and there's a lot of that translation still going on. There's like big projects, like the 84,000 project uh, that's based in US and, and, other, and elsewhere. So there's a lot of that kind of work going on, but very little uh, of the contemporary Tibetan literature gets translated. And I translate for personal, political, and literary reasons. Um, it was in 2006 when I first got the chance um, to visit Tibet. As, as a Tibetan, it's often very difficult uh, to, you, visas and you know, all this stuff, it's very difficult for Tibetans to go to Tibet. So it was in 2006 when I visited, I spent a summer there working at um, a school. I was volunteering as an English teacher for this Tibetan school. And when I left, um, I asked these teachers I'd gone to know really well, what can I as a Tibetan from outside do what is, how can I help? And he said one of the most Im important things that we can do, that you can do, is just stay connected. That uh, Tibetans inside Tibet and Tibetans outside Tibet really need to stay connected. That connection needs to remain present and alive and strong. So one of the reasons that I translate is to remain connected to the people, to the land, to the literature, to my culture. Um, and, and, and then also, you know, often just a piece of work is so beautiful, it is so gorgeously written that it needs to be respected and validated, it needs to be shared with the world. So um, I'm happy to, you know, be a small cog in, in, in being able to do that. And, uh, and I translate for political reasons. Uh, Tibet, Tibetan is, it's a second class language in Tibet in Tibet, which is now, you know, within the confines of the, of the um, modern People's Republic of China. There are economic disadvantages. I mean, the Chinese government doesn't want Tibetans really to be speaking Tibetan, to be wearing Tibetan clothes, to be writing and reading Tibetan. Um, if you remember that Tibet is still a uh, socialist, communist, state, state structure. Um, if you want a good job, you're probably going to want a government job. And uh, so you need to know Chinese. Your Chinese needs to be really good. Tibetan is not going to get you anywhere, right? So language is very specifically a site of resistance. And I see translation as an act of resistance too. Um, it is one very important tool that helps exile Tibet to remain connected with political Tibet, I'm sorry, with occupied Tibet. And uh, more and more young Tibetans who are born outside, outside of Tibet and elsewhere, just checking the time, more and more young Tibetans who are born outside and elsewhere are more comfortable with reading and writing in English often than with Tibetan, even though Tibetan is still there primary language and mother tongue. Um, so translation really helps that helps keep that connection alive with them. And you know, this connection between exile and occupied Tibet is one that the Chinese government would like to see severed. Um, in you know the last 50 years, like the one thing that the government really truly truly hates is Tibetans inside Tibet still revere His Holiness the Dalai Lama and, you know, are still just waiting for him to come back. So exiled Tibet, after all, is the proof that Tibet is not an inalienable part of China. Uh, so I do think that writers inside Tibet um, see writing as an there is an element of resistance. It is very strongly an expression of identity and freedom. 
uh, the Chinese government is one of the most restrictive governments and writing is a dangerous occupation. Just recently, uh, the Tibetan writer Shok Zhang uh, was detained and he's still under detention detention no one see, you know there's been no no word uh, officially no one seems to know quite why except uh, people suspect it has to do with a piece that he wrote about uh, militarization in Repkong which is a town in northeastern Tibet and Shok Zhang's friend uh, Tashi Rapten another writer very well known uh, was recently released from prison after spending four years uh, in jail in, in prison and his crime was that he produced this journal of political writings um, so so it, it, it can be a very dangerous occupation the thing with uh, writers and writing in Tibet is that um, often you know, someone writes something, I mean, they get punished for it. it like, they, the government doesn't wait for a translation and that sort of thing. It's, uh, so a lot of the dilemma is the writers face it themselves. They know what they can say, they know what they can't say, and then, you know, sometimes they misjudge, but they often, they know. And, um, and once you know they make the choice, I think that we need to honor that choice. It's a very conscious choice that the writer, he or she, has made. And uh, so we need to get the writing out there. And um, in general, I guess one of the things that I do prefer to translate um, though is uh, poetry and short fiction and uh, you know it's something that I'm more interested in literarily but it is also something that I think has greater enduring power and and uh, resonance for for a lot of people um, I mean with you know some of the poetry that's that I've been working with that's coming out it's just so beautiful and profound and yet abstract so that there's actually, there is, there is some space, right? And, um, and you know, there's, uh, these works deal with pain and alienation and, and marginalization and modernization and, and, um, and some of these short stories are often, you know, very heavy. They contain very he heavy elements of magical realism and absurdist humor. So um, there seems to be these spaces that they're using. Um, but in general, actually, a lot of the Tibetan writing is very, the Tibetan writing world is very insular uh, from the mainstream writing from the international writing community, there really needs to be more um, interaction and more more connection, and that's something that you know, as translators, we can help make that happen. It's a very important mission. Uh, for in, I mean, the four internationally known Tibetan writers uh, are Ale and Wuser, who write in Chinese, and Jamyang Norbu and Tsering Wang Modomba, who write in English. There is right now no internationally known Tibetan writer writing in Tibetan. Um, but Tibetan is a language in which great literature can also be written. Um, and it's a language in which great literature is being written, right? Uh, so it just needs to be shared and, and to be seen and heard. And it's something that uh, as a translator, uh, something that I think we, we have uh, a role in helping to show that Tibetan is a language in which great literature can be written and is being written. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Over to Alice Guthrie. Is this on? Yeah, hi. Thank you both, that was really interesting, both presentations. Let me just find the start of my notes. Um, so, yeah, I thought I would look at gender and sexuality um, in terms of uh, 
well working within the patriarchy, as we all do, and what comes up around that when you translate between two languages that are kind of posited as representing different uh, gender orders or paradigms, but perhaps don't, and perhaps are more on a spectrum with each other and other kind of, you know, boring old stuff about East and West and how we navigate that. So um, there's a whole load of fascinating other areas of the topic, the brief, that I'm not going to address at all, um, such as working for large dubious organisations, but, I mean, I have I've been able to not because... Translation hasn't been my main income, so that's kind of, yeah, that would be a different... I've, I've done other work, not that I've had a private fortune. Um, but, th yeah, that would be um, a, a completely different way to have gone, to have worked for um, GCHQ or whatever as an Arabist. But I never did. So um, can't say much about that. Um, but, yeah, so... Um, I was thinking about... Talking about one particular example that came up for me um, just in the l latter part of last year, which I thought was quite interesting. So I work a lot at the moment on contemporary Syrian stuff. And um, last year I was really excited to be part of a wonderful project called Syria Speaks, um, which was supported by Penn, actually. And um, the book, the full title is Syria Speaks, Arts and Culture from the Frontline. And it's a really, I can, I can massively plug it because I'm only one of many translators that worked on it. So I'm really impressed by it. It's everyone else's work. Um, yeah, it includes journalism and fiction and um, poetry and reportage and visual art and stuff about film and stuff about comic uh, art, graphic novel art and all of that. So it's a, it, I'd urge you to search it out if you're looking for contemporary Syrian work. So um, in the longer part of the publishing of the book, as in trying to keep it in the public eye, various events were happening. And um, I guess about six months after it was already out last year, um, the editors and, and promoters wanted to put on an event in London um, in a theatre and they contacted me to have a look at a text. So what had happened in the interim since the book had been translated and published was that Daesh or ISIS or Islamic State or whatever you want to call them had, had you know, taken over Raqqa and other cities in Syria. That whole thing had really exploded. And so what the editors were very keen to find was... Um, an example of the secular, satirican, satirical Syrian uh, response, literary response to the presence of that organisation and all of that horror. And um, you may or may not be aware that satire has been a really massive part of the Syrian um, resistance and really important. So um, they were... I felt, I felt this was great, you know, I, I supported them in wanting to um, find an example of this stuff and I was pleased that they were scrabbling around with their contacts and finding something and they were excited, good friends of mine, these editors, they were excited to get in touch with me with this piece and say, right, well, we don't read Arabic, so this particular person doesn't read Arabic, so, yep, it's about a sniper and a prostitute and it's based on the Gilgamesh epic and it's going to be great for our show. So... I was excited too, right? Because, you know, this, this sounded um, like an, a very interesting approach um, to resisting Daesh. Um, let me just see if I missed anything. I'm racing ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, so I had a look at this text and was really, really disappointed and really horrified by it. <laughs> and that's what I really wanted to talk to you about because I think it's a really interesting example in so many ways of, I mean, one of the things that's going on there is that there's a sense that the fact that there's a secular, satirical, um, sexually irreverent response to the presence of ISIS has to somehow be proved to a London audience. I mean, that is part of the premise for the event. Is it, uh, you know, does it have to actually be, be proved? And I think that's very interesting in the light of Orientalism. That's, a, you know, a whole nother, um, could be a whole nother presentation. But um, what actually happened in this story was that it was very, very disappointingly sexist and trivializing of the woman involved, I felt. I should backtrack a little. So perhaps some of you know about Gilgamesh, which is an ancient Sumerian epic um, from that area, right? So um, there's 
there's so much exciting stuff about Gilgamesh that if you hear that there's been a, a contemporary riff on it for by activists that you'd get excited about. Um, it's, you know, for those of you that don't know it, it's a kind of ancient cosmic meditation on humanity. I wrote this earlier on. Humanity, sexuality, war, power, authority, friendship, violence, the interplay of species in our world, etc., etc., etc. It's It's quite an important text, right? And so how exciting to get hold of this text that's working with it. Um, and one of the, um, you know, things that came up really about this is the way that um, sexism and patriarchal paradigms and stuff get kind of simplified, magnified and enforced during times of revolution or upheaval. So this is a bit like the kind of Naomi Klein shock doctrine thing, right? Like there's no time for democracy now. There's no time for feminism now. Like we'll deal with that later. You know, let's get on with the, the, the big stuff in hand. And obviously it can go the other way, right? Because during, you know, the famous case like in the Algerian revolution, the women were allowed were, were suddenly doing all this stuff and carrying arms. And I know that's gone on in Colombia. And okay, another whole other presentation about gender roles in, in armed conflict. But um, yeah, certainly what I was one of the things I was most worried about with this text was that um, the, the first version, what I said of, of things getting magnified and enforced during a revolutionary moment was what was happening. And so um, we in London were keen to take this text and amplify it by translating it and perform it despite the fact that there was some really problematic gender stuff in the story. And, um, and I think that for me is something that does actually come up in different guises quite a lot as a translator. That's nice, someone's nodding. <laughs> it's good to see a nod. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, as I said, this was a, it is a project that I really value and wanted to support. So it wasn't, it wasn't simple because it wasn't, you know, like people that I don't respect or don't trust or whatever. Um, one of the things that I was concerned about was really, well, I suppose the wider context is um, if you're kind of awake to gender inequality in the world, which you know, most of us in this room probably are, and if you're kind of wanting that to be resolved, then how far do you dare to take that? And how far can it inform every bit of your work? And not least because um, one of the things that tends to happen, as we all know, right, is that there's been this dichotomy constructed of us and them, right, the whole East-West nonsense that you know they are doing one thing and we're doing another rather than it being a spectrum so if we just start translating and publishing um, work that denigrates women and denigrates sex workers and I'll get into the detail of that in a minute and sec um, sexist stuff and patriarchal stuff from Arabic and presenting it as a, an authentic Syrian voice uh, or as the authentic Syrian voice then we risk um, making people think that you know, that's how Easterners or Arabs or Muslims or Syrians or that's how they think and that's how they live, right? So I, I find it very, very important to look at what we give a voice, you know, what we amplify more or less. Am I doing all right for time? Yeah, about two minutes. Oh, about two minutes, okay. <laughs> so what's the main point then of of this whole thing. So should I tell, well, I could tell you like the detail a little bit more of the, um, of actually what was, okay, so what I loved about it, what, what was important about it was, as I said, it's this satire, it's based on Gilgamesh, how exciting, and that it's activist literature, it's like hot off the laptop, you know, it's just come in from Raqqa, from this city. Um, but what happened that was wrong with it, I felt, um, was, it was the reduction of this very complex figure in the original epic who's a kind of sexual pri priestess like in lots of old traditions right you had these kind of um, interesting female figures that had a, a shamanic sexual role in, in ancient religions that we hardly understand anymore that in the story got reduced to her just being a prostitute and at the same time the role of a, a female sex worker in the current um, economic climate of Syria you can imagine there might be quite a lot of reasons why women are having to work in that um, particular industry at, at, with the state of the economy as it is at the moment in Syria. That was reduced or, or conflated with a kind of very strong patriarchal value judgment about women's desire and women's sexuality. Um, 
It was also kind of very euphemistic, so there was a big cringe factor, you know. She's the, the woman, the character has a beauty spot in a certain place, and, you know, this stuff doesn't translate very well, if it's said like that. She had no agency, she seemed thick, she was patronised by the narrator, um, as well as being marginalised at the same time, even though she's actually the central force for change, which is familiar to anyone who lives in a patriarchal reality, right? You get kind of patronised and marginalised at the same time. Um, yeah, so um, I advised them not to do it. Oh, yeah, the portrayal of the, the actual ISIS people was problematic too, but I don't have time to get into that. So I advised them actually not to do it, and they did do it, and I did translate it for them. <laughs> <gasps> Reader, I did it. <laughs> um, and it was performed, and I suppose the sort of slightly... Yeah, I'm rushing slightly now. Note that I wanted to end it on was that I just think that stuff is all really, really, really nuanced. <laughs> and that people that I respect wanted to do that and put it on. And that there was such debate about it and such division amongst all of us, um, Arab and non-Arab and so on and so on, um, that, yeah, I guess I wanted to just um, really highlight it. I, I resp I'm not... I'm not I, I respect myself still for having done it and I respect them for having wanted me to do it, but I feel kind of sad about the whole thing, really. <laughs> the end. <laughs> well, thank you all very, very much for presenting three very, very different responses. Um, sorry, can you not hear? Um, I think we did a lot on what it's really dangerous to translate, and then it all got very political. And I thought we were getting to the point of what you absolutely would not translate with the last one, and then you went and translated it. So it wasn't I'm a just... very short piece. It wasn't a novel. Okay. Did I make that clear? It was an no. excerpt. <laughs> okay. But I, I would just like to reiterate the question, whether given how political the whole context is, is there something that you would really absolutely draw the line at translating. I speak as the, what am I, stepdaughter of someone who had a very devout Catholic conscience who translated the whole of Colette with no problems. Um, but then, you know, one generation later, when it all got a bit loopier, um, she really would not uh, carry on translating Violette Leduc. So, you know, people have all kinds of reasons why they might not allow themselves or their consciences might not allow them to do something. Do you think there would be a...? Uh, well, I would say if there was state, you know, Chinese government propaganda literature, state literature, if there were... but if, that sort of thing. And then if there were Tibetans writing, right, from a very, very propagandist, uh, propagandistic sort of view, but there are hardly any writers doing that kind of writing. And then even actually if there was something like that, I would probably go and translate it because I thought it needed to be translated, but I wouldn't take money for it. Um, you know, so if someone commissioned me to do it and, and was paying me, then I probably wouldn't do it. Um, for why would you do it if you didn't want to do it on ethical grounds and you didn't because, earn any money? Because you... maybe pe people do need to see it. Okay. Just because people, be because something is so awful that they need to see it for that sort of thing, and for that sort of reason. You could be sure they would read it with a critical eye rather than just read it as propaganda. So maybe it needs a translator's preface. Okay. But maybe the people who commission it wouldn't allow the translator to have a preface. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is the sharp edge. How about you, Alice? Can you, uh, as you say, quite often we think of a, almost like a cultural clash between um, a lot of Arabic literary texts and um, a pro feminist, anti -patriarchal, patriarchal Western stance. So. Where does the well that that's the, the that's the illusion that I'm trying to chip away yeah. at the notion that we're on the same spectrum as each other 
at different moments in terms of our gender order is a really important one for me. And then and that informs my choices of what, what I work on. And obviously, every time you do something that you don't really believe in, you're, you're not doing, or someone's not doing, the other thing that you might, right? So every, by, everything you amplify, by definition, deafens out something else. So that... Um, but, yeah, I, I maybe didn't make it clear enough that that was a really short piece as part of a theatre production with lots of different excerpts. Oh, right. I so thought it was, it was a whole play. So it yeah. wasn't a whole play, and mm-hmm. it wasn't, yeah, much less, yeah, a novel or anything. And it was for a one-off event, and it wasn't actually published anywhere, so that was part of the decision. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there's lots of things that I wouldn't translate for... Um, all sorts of ethical reasons yeah I think that comes into it all the time because it's very different to your context really because it's such a huge massive amount of people and such a massively wide ranging you know it's 400 million speakers so there's uh, all sorts of diversity you know and nonsense that I might not touch with a barge pole (laughs) it's really interesting because as translators we're all taught to um translate within context to understand the context of the author that we're translating and to incorporate that into our translations as much as possible to give the flavor of the original. But um, here we seem to be talking much more about the, the target context, if you like, through the target language and whether you can introduce an element of criticism in your translation or in the way you frame your translation so that the target readers will read it in a particular way, with a critical eye, perhaps. What do you feel about Well, there's an interesting question, really, which is, uh, would we translate Hitler's Mein Kampf if it hadn't already been translated? Um, I wonder what my fellow translators think about that, because I know what I think. Well, as a fellow translator, I'll jump in while you two are thinking. Um, I think now it would be read as an historical document, probably of a madman, um, and therefore it would have historical interest and not much else. But just to mention how fraught still that whole area is and what a charge it has, I remember um, going to see the um, director of a very famous art gallery in Paris that specialized in surrealist art. And he said he went round to borrow some pictures from Dorimar, um, uh, Picasso's one-time lover and a sort of cubist um, surrealist artist. And uh, when he went into her flat, which was just behind Saint-Sulpice, he saw a copy of Mein Kampf open on the kitchen table. And he said he left without um, loaning and exhibiting any of the pictures because it just gave him the shivers. So you can see the responses may be very different. How do you you have a reaction? Oh, yeah, I I agree that it would be now a historical document that would be part of the... You know, if somehow, by fluke, it had never been translated, it would be an important part of the archive, wouldn't it, about European history? Mm. Yeah. Elite... Can't you I'm even sorry, access is there a roving this, mic? This woman is saying it's illegal in Germany. You can't even own a copy of Mein Kampf. No, I know. Is it is it not accessible on any in any archive? Were Vladimir Putin to put pen to paper and write the modern day equivalent for Russia, would you translate that, Arch? That is a very good question. It's uh, really what I had in mind. <laughs> uh, and um, I mean, I think the cop out is to say uh, I. Uh, I did, I did my thesis on uh, the Soviet Commissar of Education, a gentleman called Lunacharsky. Mm-hmm. And um, he argued during the revolution when everyone was saying, oh, we mustn't translate this and we mustn't allow that to be published. He would say, yeah, publish it all. It's just that if the ideology is incorrect, then we must provide um, a suitable commentary so that innocence shouldn't be um, uh, led into uh, evil ways. Um, I think that um, I would have to see it. And if it was too convincing, I might not. (laughs) But on the whole, I mean, I think I probably would. I think it's rather unlikely that I'm going to be invited to. (laughs) Given your track record. Um, Look, thinking of what I have refused to translate, there's not very much. I was offered a story one time which uh, was by an author I'd already translated. And when I read it, I just didn't believe it, and either I thought it was a fake uh, over his name, 
or I thought he'd been coerced. And so I just quietly dumped it. And something else I don't translate, if, if your client becomes abusive, I'd better not say which client it was, but one client started sending me emails with um, uh, multiple colors and capital letters and vast numbers of exclamation marks and um, uh, telling me um, uh, how I should be translating uh, his immortal prose. And um, eventually uh, started arguing that he shouldn't have to pay for the translation of numerals because they were the same in Russian and in English, so I wasn't really translating them. And um, he shouldn't be paying for and and the, uh, because once I'd translated it, I'd kind of done it. And so I, um, but you have to be pretty far off the wall for me not to translate you. <laughs> um, well, you need a mic, we can't hear you. Ah, um, Natasha, of course. No, I just, uh, uh, well, uh, people know Leo Tolstoy, but there was another Tolstoy, Alexei Tolstoy, and Arch refused to translate him because he collaborated with the Bolshevik government. That's a very good point, uh, and I have a bit of explaining to do. It has already been translated. I mean, it was translated a long, long time ago. It is enormously long. It would have taken a lot of my time, but basically, you're right, I was just out of sympathy with the guy and I didn't want to translate it. I checked out what the text was, People said it was just endlessly long stuff about the First World War, and I just felt it would be a waste of time. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll take one more question, if we mustn't get into a dialogue, uh, if there is one, uh, because otherwise we'll be booted out of our seats, I think. Um, I just had a question for Alice. I was just wondering, with your um, that piece you translated for the event, did, was there any chance for you um, as a translator there to kind of contextualise that on the night or to kind of put your opinion across? Or was it just kind of... No, no, not at all, actually. Um, I was, funnily enough, I was abroad at the time, uh, honestly. <laughs> I couldn't go. <laughs> but no, it had to be... It, yeah, it was, it was as part of a performance with no... Because I, I kind of argued for that as well. But... No, it was presented as was. I, I, we made an excerpt, so we were able to cut out some of the worst <laughs> stuff. That was a swift question. There was one more over here somewhere. Uh, oh, you're pointing to over there somewhere. This is okay. I am, I'm very interested in the personal ethical objections, but I do wonder about whether by not translating you um, on grounds that the, the text is not coherent with our current values, you're actually not sort of narcissistically reproducing the prejudices of the Anglo zone and preventing literally from us, us seeing what's happening on the other side of the on my mirror. And I think the Chinese example was a perfect one. One really does want to know. So when, how do you draw that line? Especially I did the, the Syrian example was fascinating for that reason. I'm so sorry, I missed part of the question because there was no deep whether you know, not translating doesn't perpetuate um, mm -hmm. our sense that this is a world that we will only that gets filtered that already corresponds to our our set, sets of values that we hold dear, but which nonetheless are filtered. Um, I was going to say earlier actually that I probably would do the translation of something like Mein Kampf, and I know of course I'm speaking historically, but even something that, that I thought either has historical value now or later, um, I think maybe something like that does need to be translated. And then I would write, you know, even if it wasn't like the, the publishing company or whoever, uh, the government didn't allow the preface or something there, then I would just write a separate thing about why I thought everything in it was wrong and here's why. Um, it's, I, I think, I do think people need to know. I wanted to, yeah, in answer to your question, I think it's 
I know what you're saying, but I think it's really re important to remember that there are filters all the time, and no one's ob objective, and we're all, you know, even if everything got published in the world, we'd still choose what we picked up anyway. And then, we, you know, there'd be filters about what got um, reported on in the literary press and, and so on. But in reality, we are all filtering, and that there's the myth of the level playing field, that somehow everybody can speak and everything can be said, isn't realistic from my point of view so we I think we sort of need to maybe be a bit more out about that and work and work with it uh, I think uh, translators ought not to be censors but um, there is this question of how much time do you have how many hours in the day and I think that's what would that's the nearest I would come to censorship I would tend to translate work that I was sympathetic with and uh, just pass over uh, work that I found offensive or which mm, didn't. Uh, but I, I agree with you that it's very important that we don't just filter everything and make it bland and cozy. And uh, we, we do need to know what's going on in the rest of the world. We need to know what people we disagree with are saying and how they're thinking. And we really, really do need to wind up now, but there is a yes, no answer you can give to one question we've been handed on a sheet of paper saying, have any of us ever been threatened or trolled? Or had a, oh, I couldn't read that bit, had a visa restriction. Have you had your visa restricted going to Russia? Quickly. Uh, this session is being videoed <laughs> and I have no comment to make. Oh, have you? Um, well, ever since I start, so visa restrictions, I don't know because I haven't applied since for a visa. But I mean, even, you know, uh, Tibetan friends of mine who are just ordinary citizens have had their visas to Tibet refused. Um, apparently, the people at the counter just say, no, you can't have a visa. You know why. And that's it. Um, ever since... I started working at the office of Tibet. Uh, I mean, our computers, you know, we were constantly getting Trojans. Uh, and even now, every once in a while, you know, I'll get like a Google alert, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's it. Alice? Mm, touch words, I don't think so. <laughs> I wouldn't know if I'd been trolled or not because I'm so hopelessly untechnological, I'm spared that. <laughs> Visa, problems with visas, yes. Uh, threats, yes. Arrests and all kinds of other things, but not simply on grounds of translation. And it was a while ago at the height of uh, Contra Wars in Central America. Um, so not a lot of fun, but nothing immediate, I'm glad to say. Um, as to what not to translate... I think we've had some incredibly highly principled responses. I didn't know what I was expecting. I came to this open-mindedly. And I'm very, very impressed by my colleagues. And I do have to admit that as a translator, my first reaction was, well, not to translate what I don't like, what isn't good literature to me. Um, and that includes most of the poetry I get sense. But then that's what T.S. Eliot said as well, and so did Ezra Pound. But thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for taking it so seriously. It's been really fascinating. Thank you.